Good morning. Lovely to see you all here for our 20th holding space at Sydney Centre for Creative Change. My name is Jackie Short. I'm the Director of Sydney Centre and it's wonderful to welcome you here to another of our free holding space webinars. We have 60 delightful minutes coming up for you talking about making meal times marvellous. We have two guest presenters with us today who I'll introduce to you in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I come to you from today, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation, and pay our collective respects to Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging around this great land of ours in Australia. Today, after our presentation, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions of our guest presenters, Phoebe and Mandy, and there'll also be an opportunity to connect in with one or two other people in a small group that we're going to have. And if I could ask you to keep your microphones on mute until we come to the question time. And if you're able to have your cameras on, it would be wonderful to be able to see you. So if you can um, keep the mics off, that's great. And cameras are ideal if you can have them on. After our breakout rooms, where you have a chance to have a discussion and connect in with a few other people, what we're going to do is have a quick activity where you could win one of our upcoming webinars for free and I'm going to tell you about some of our other upcoming things. This is our 20th holding space today. Welcome one and all and especially welcome our guest presenters Phoebe Cormack who's a registered music therapist and Mandy Dos Santos who is a, she's waving there for us, she <laughs> is a nutritionist and they've both got a fantastic presentation for us today. So welcome guys and I'll hand over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. So I will, um, how lovely to see all your lovely faces there. Um, we, I'm going to share the screen so you can see the presentation that we've um, created for you guys. Excuse me as I do that. So can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that presentation on the side there? Awesome. awesome. So um, as Jackie mentioned for her uh traditional custodians of the land that she sits on for us here on the Central Coast. It's um, Dukanjung and Gurungai, um, and we pay our respects um, to past, present and future custodians of that land and thrilled mm. to be here. Totally so, thrilled to be here. As Jackie mentioned, our presentation today is called Making Mealtimes Marvellous. Uh, that's actually a title of one of our songs. We are Musical Kitchen. Um, we're going to talk about it later. We're going to talk about that, obviously, <laughs> today. Uh, so I'll just flick on to the next um, screen. If I can. If it lets you. There we go. Yeah. So, so I'm Phoebe. I um, originally studied a music degree in jazz vocals, and then I completed a Master's of Music Therapy at UTS. Um, since then, I started the music therapy program at Bear Cottage as a new grad and was there for nine years. And following that, after I had two children, I created private practice. And so I've been seeing a diverse range, always in pediatrics, um, of children um, with different diagnoses, but mainly spectrum neurological um, diagnoses. So that's me. <laughs> and then this is me. My name's Mandy Dos Santos. Um, my background's originally in food science. Uh, I used to work a lot in processed and manufacturing foods, developing products. Um, and then have always had a passion around um, nutrition. Mm. And then when my first daughter was born, I went back to do um, post-grad in human nutrition and have worked in that since then in more of a space of community health and food education. Um, I don't really see one-on-one -on -one, uh, clients. I do more um, education in early learning centers and with family kind of workshops and working with educators um, and really about creating resources to support that. So um, with my little business, Little People Nutrition, I work with um, creating products to support food education, health education mm -hmm. for, for young people, families, and the adults and carers in their lives. And then recently, well, about, what was it, Phoebe? About four or five years ago, we had um, your eldest and my middle uh, in school together, and we met and we went on a Kicked few friend off. dates and then <laughs> created a musical kitchen. I needed Mandy's brain for, for some of my clients and she needed my yep. brain for some of her um, early learning centre. Yeah, so I guess one of the things was we both realised the need. I mean, I'd seen working with 
um, that that age group of children that I work with the real need to, for um, story and music and how powerful that was on um, getting um, the message across um, to them, to the children, but also the adults and, and mm. carers in their lives. Um, and obviously, Vic has that skill set massively. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, really focusing on that play-based learning for children in particular. Um, and I've always been a lover of food. In fact, yeah. my first degree was... Um, <laughs> it was hospitality. was hospitality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so food and beverage. Um, and so, yeah, we just clicked. So we're going to talk to you about why we do what we do and how we do it, basically. So, so today, um, some of the points that we're kind of going to really talk to um, is the role of adults and carers in children's eating and food education. So it really is about, um, it's always about the child, but often we are educating the adult within their life as well. Um, and that sort of dual kind of, yeah, massively. <laughs> massively. <laughs> the situation there is really um, interlinked and can't really be separated. Yeah, and then how music helps encapsulate the story and the message that we're trying to get across to the children and the caregivers. Yeah. And then very much, and we're going to use our songs. Yeah, some of our songs as examples. Examples of that. And then um, the last point, sort of really talking about the language development. And again, that's not just for the child, although they are developing their language there, but also for the adults and carers and educators in, in their lives. I'm just going to shut the window because our neighbours have started snoring. <laughs> Suburbia. <laughs> All right. Oh. It's all right. Sorry so um, the next couple of slides, I won't really talk to them too much. I guess one of the things we really just wanted to um, highlight that sometimes with this, it's become really popular sort of music for children. Um, that sort of space has become really big. We're part entertain of, yeah, yeah. In, in that space. But often it's very much about entertainment, not saying that their words aren't important or good, but I guess our um, focus is really more about education. So we really... Um, when we're writing our songs and um, the flow of the, the shows or the incursions, it's really important that we follow um, sort of the learning outcomes for not only the early years, which we cover off very easily, the um, outcomes of one to five, but also um, our songs really cover off um, key areas in the early stage one and stage one for yeah. early primary. So that's like kindy prep to grade two um, in the creative arts. And we've just sort of listed out some of our songs there, PDHP. Um, personal health choices and science in the living world and also in the earth and space so that was really important to us to really bring depth to our songs as well um, so that it can be used by more areas as well um, within that education yeah, space absolutely so this is my side um, one of my main areas so our role as adults and carers and children's eating and food education and I'm pulling on here I don't know if you guys have come across Ellen Satter's division of responsibility um, it's a really powerful um, eating theory mm. and I think probably in the last five years for myself I've really developed in my um, professional kind of learning and understanding of education and health education it's really about the how for little people rather than the what um, and especially the children and families that are struggling it really they all know that they should be eating more vegetables or whatnot but how do we actually get that to happen so um, I've worked a lot with sort of OTs and speeches um, and they are all also very fond of this um, theory here so I just wanted to talk to it a little bit to explain what that might mean if you guys haven't um, heard of it before so and it's also really foundation of what we're doing oh totally well. foundational to the songs that we write especially the ones about um eating and and choice sharing. Yeah, yeah choice sharing choice food. and control and things like that with the children so um ellen's um theory is that the parent or care or educator decides what their child eats when and where they eat and the child decides if and how much and so it's really um separating out whose responsibility it is in that eating relationship. Mm. Obviously, that then comes with huge asterisks. And um, the next slide sort of talking about decision trees that come to those decisions. Every family is incredibly unique and the child's situation is often, is also very unique mm. um, as 
fee sort of works with children that are sometimes off the spectrum, for instance, or sensory processing disorders or, or whatnot, that, that is a very different situation to um, perhaps, you know, um, two working parents that work full time, um, the way that they'll structure things is, is quite different and, and unique. So in um, the division of responsibility, what their child eats, so a parent obviously decides that um, at, they, they buy it, of course, the child might say, oh, I would like to buy this or whatever, but the, the actual purchaser is, mm. is the adult in, in the household. Um, they also decide what's on the menu. Of course, there's discussion there with, with the children, but they are the ones that decide that. And I think sometimes parents forget that. Mm. Um, I know I have mm. families that come to me and say, my child wants chocolate for breakfast. So does mine, but it's not the, it doesn't mean that that's the best choice. Ice cream in our house. Yeah, ice cream for breakfast. Like clearly I want to eat a cross on a day, but you know, it's not going to keep me energized for the whole day, right? So we are the decider and owner of that responsibility. Um, <coughs> when um, their child eats, and again, that's really um, dependent on families, you know, what your rhythm and routine is for, for the mm. day and in a childcare situation as well. You know, babies will have different sleep patterns or, you know, toddlers, yeah. when are their sleep times? When are they most active? When will they more likely eat more? Um, and also um, having that rhythm and routine so that the child understands when the next thing is coming, that they know that they're going to be having a meal time or whatnot. So when is really um, decided um, by the parent or adult um, and where. Um, a big one. The where is a big one and it's one that is sometimes lacking in sort of modern society. Obviously our ideal goal is sitting around a table, um, not just from the social and emotional benefits, but obviously um, from the um, biomechanics of the way that you sit and eat. Um, and digestion and also being present at the mealtime. Of course, as the decision tree can be quite different um, if a child um, you know, can only eat sitting down on their knees on the coffee table, uh, we work towards what, what the goal is, but let's get them eating at the, the coffee table and then you work, work from there. Uh, and I think sometimes parents especially have um, real difficulty with understanding the division of responsibility and what the child decides, um, being if they will eat it and how much. And I, I think this is something that uh, we live in a very food abundant society. Um, and if we structure the rhythm and routine around as much as we can with the parent or adult or carer's um, responsibilities, it will set the child up best to be able to um, express, but also eat when they, they the time is to eat. Um, again, this comes obviously with heaps of asterisks de depending on, on children, um, but it is a really um, powerful um, theory. Uh, and if you look into more information about it um, on Ellen's um, site is down there, she has a lot of resources that support that and go into more detail around those asterisks, which is, which is great. Um, is that I don't have how many children are there? One, two, three. I don't have that many children. I only have three. Don't worry, I'm not crazy. Um, but I, this is just an example, I guess, of just sitting up at the table and you know, that there is actually bird's eye, um, uh, crumbed fish that goes in the oven. <laughs> That's just real life, but you know, having everything presented there, everyone's got chairs, you know, it's it's the way to sort of set up that family environment and they just simply adore it. But they get to choose. They get to there. choose as well. And so I think that's the thing. You've served. I've served. You've chosen. Yeah. So this is probably a bit of an example partially of family style eating as well, mm. um, where it's all out, which um in many different um, cultures they just eat like that anyway if you think of a lot of Asian cultures you know having all the food spread out or um, sort of like Mexican dishes it's all kind of all spread out and deconstructed on the table and people get the children or everybody gets to decide what they put on their plate which we mm -hmm. talked to a few songs with that as well um, which is great and you take really um, supports that division of responsibility theory and giving the children control over what's going on their plate. They've got their safe foods there that they might uh, like to eat all the time, be that pasta or, you know, chicken or, or bread or something, but then they've got the other foods there for them to be able to decide. And I think just in talking nutritionally as well, um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, but they only eat pasta and cheese and one slice of carrot. I'm like, that's three food groups. That's amazing. You know, you've got carbohydrates, you've got protein and calcium there with the cheese and then a veggie and different textures too, which is amazing because texture can be a huge issue with so many children. Massive. 
Um, and then I love that little um, broccoli picture there that um, there's an at their kid friendly meals, um, you know, ignored, played with, lit, spit out, eaten. We talked to one of our songs, sniff it, lick it. Yeah. Really food exploration. That's my biggest thing with little people nutrition is really letting the children explore. It can be so um, stimulating food and we forget that as adults how overpowering the flavors and smells and mm. textures actually are mm. um and through exploration not only with the playing of food but through the music and understanding mm. the language is, is just so powerful well the language again so i can probably talk more to this um at the end that's my adorable little boy who's about to start kindy in next week <laughs> uh really important the language that you use at home obviously not bribing forcing punishing rewarding with food comparing with other children um and talking about their eating patterns in front of them um and framing those or shaming I just did a talk about lunchbox shaming um on radio today um and how yeah. disastrous that can be yeah. not good see um so i'm just going to talk to you about how we use music as the conduit. And I think um, it says why Dr. Anita Collins, um, she's a Australian um, educator of music, but she also has crossed over into the neuroscience sort of world um, and, and talks a lot with um, neurologists about how music actually affects us as human beings. And that's, um, it, that's a really emerging sort of, um area um and it's a wonderful area for music therapists because there's you know scientific proof that what we're doing is actually fantastic um and so she talks about how the brain when we do actually just receptive music listening rather than participating in music making. Our brain compartmentalizes the different sounds, the different words, the different rhythms, melodic patterns, all into different areas of the brain. And, um, and, then, they anal and then it analyzes that same piece of music as a whole. So it's not just looking at it as a whole piece. Um, it's actually picking out the bits that we need in order to learn and grow. Um, so we really try and use that sort of um, analogy um, when we're writing our songs. I'm just getting my ukulele out um, because I'm going to use it in a second. Um, so when we come to looking at early years, um, particularly children um, in that very formative, um, uh, in the formative years of learning, most of it is done through play through storytelling, through music making, whether it's making up a la 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 as they're walking through the house and no one knows what they're actually doing except <laughs> singing to themselves. And so we've really considered that um, when we've written our songs, the tempo that we're choosing. The repetition. Absolute repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. We're going to flow. use and the yeah. flow. And so um, Marvelous Meal Times was written. Um, I write a lot of transition songs with my clients um, to particularly spectrum clients um, to get them from one place to another or to help them through their day. And so this really was our transition song. But even for neuro, like typical neuro -typical children, kids, it's like yeah. the rhythm and routine of the day is powerful in a home environment, but also, I mean, I know even my own children, what's happening tomorrow? What's happening today? Yeah. What's happening in an hour? So having this, the flow gives, especially if children, marvellous mealtimes, a lot of children feel anxious about yeah. mealtime. So if they know what's coming and the flow of what's happening in the routine and rhythm of mealtimes, um, that can help them, but also help the adult um, in their life to be able to say, oh, you know, um, remember in marvellous mealtimes, this is what happens next. Yeah. And so this song is really a step-by-step -step for the child to understand what's, what's going to come um, before they sit down to have some dinner. I'm just trying to. So we're just gonna sing the first verse and then the chorus so that you get the general gist. It's time to make a meal marvelous. And then a 
<laughs> set, setting the table, setting the mood. And so those processes for children are not only helping them understand what needs to happen to get to a meal time, but also gives them the opportunity to start feel feeling safe mm. about getting to the table and eventually sitting down and potentially being presented with foods that they may or may not want to try yeah. um, in that safe space. So I love that one. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> We're about to record it actually yeah. <laughs> to go on to the, the new album. But um, so then we come to Can You Eat the Rainbow? So that's obviously um, one from like a nutritional point of view. Um, I'm not very fond of the binary decision of healthy and unhealthy, no. especially for and, young children. And we don't use that at all <coughs> in the language. Yeah, so uh, we, we use the idea of the rainbow, not only from a macro but micronutrient point of view in terms of food groups, but um, yeah, all the minerals and vitamins. So talking again to the to the child um, from a dinner perspective, a snack perspective, perspective, lunchbox perspective, but also adults in terms of um, what to pack in those kind of spaces. So keeping it really simple. Um, and also when we go through all the food groups um, in there, you know, touching. It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not just fruit and veg. It's not just fruit and veg. It's different sort of multicultural dishes as well, bring that sort of into it. Um, and yeah, just... Can, and then also giving, bringing it back to them, asking them a question, can you eat the rainbow? Yeah. Can you, you know, so um, asking them, that's such a wonderful way for a child to say, oh, I've had red, I've had yellow, I've had green. Or and, and as we wrote this song, we were really um, specific as to what <coughs> foods we chose. So I'll give you an example. <coughs> Strawberries, oranges, lemons and basil, blueberries, eggplants, they all so there's the colour red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet of the rainbow so that the kids are not only getting, oh, look at all these yummy fruits and veggies, but if they then take it into a play yeah. um, situation in their classroom or in the play area in an early learning centre, they might set the... So we've just been talking about our Sniff It, Lick It song and going into oh, hold on, sorry. Um, I need to, sorry, child I need to care. Um, and exploring those different um, textures of different foods. And, and so this song really was created with all the sweet, salty, mm. um, hot, cold, spicy. Um, is it yummy? Is it yucky? Is it's it? okay to say that you don't like something. And I think that goes back a bit to Ellen said, a child can say, I don't like this. That's yeah, okay. That's okay to not like something. Yeah. Um, we actually talk about that as well, what we don't like and why we don't like it. So we often ask children, you know, people often ask children what they do like. Well, what don't What's you like? What's your no-go food? Yeah. So. And that's okay. They can have, they can have choice, you know. We are, we're all human. Um, and we will talk to choice and control in just a second. But um, so the song is, is it sweet or is it salty? Is it salty? Or, or is, is it? it? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> is it crunchy? Is it yummy? Or is it yucky? Come on, let's give it a try. We're gonna sniff it, lick it, and give it a kiss. We're gonna smell it, taste it, and roll it around. We're gonna sniff it, lick it, and give it a kiss. Come on, let's give it a try. And that comes from um, <laughs> OT and speech when yeah. they are doing feeding sort of consultations that sniff it lick it and give it a kiss is is foundation to learning to the texture. taste yeah. things um from a feeding perspective so we might just move on from there if our sound's not great so really um really as we said before when we were developing this program the language behind the story was really really important and we've really shied away from using that the, the healthy and unhealthy um, dichotomy. But, um, uh, yeah, so I guess the thing is as well, we think about our song order as well. We've put in there from paddock to plate. I mean, with food education, it's, you know, we've seen with so many different people in the food education space, so important for children to know where their food's coming from. Um, we also recently wrote a song, Pitter Patter, because last 
last year or two years ago we went to scone and it was so dry we're in the middle of drought so just the importance of water um not only to grow food but also for our bodies and things like that so yeah really understanding so our songs do go from um water now um and then the seed to it growing yeah. to it, um, the farmers growing it, um, whether they're growing um, produce or livestock. And we do talk about where we get our foods because... Where they shop. A lot of children are quite disconnected. It's, it's you know, chickens are packed in woolies, yeah. you know. So um, where where does it all come from? Do you go to the butcher? Do you go to the bakery? Do you go to the greengrocer? Do, do you get it online sometimes? Yeah. You know, Ding like dong. all those different things. Um making children and um yeah the people that we see aware of the different avenues that you can get your food yeah and then obviously uh how we prepare it at home so we have cooking songs um and then setting up the table and then yeah eating it which is and we've got a new digestion song too. oh yes we've got a poo song coming song up coming because it's right. very important to know I mean, that's the key thing is, are you regular? (laughs) I'm reading a great story at the moment, a book, um, The Dirt Cure by a um, paediatric neuroscientist. I think she's American, but it's interesting. She always asks, how regular are your poos? Yeah, it's important. (laughs) And then the choice and control thing is, um, I know as a therapist is a really important um, goal for children it empowers them it gives them the opportunity to um, form their own individual ideas rather than um, pressing as an adult our own ideas of what you should be eating and how you should be eating and all that sort of stuff onto the child and uh, lots of us do have (laughs) interesting backgrounds of you know I know I had to sit at the table and I had to eat everything on my plate yeah. And then I would get dessert. I don't do that with my children. Um, in fact, we normally serve most of what we're going to eat and what's on offer at the table. And if they want to eat the strawberries and the, you know, the yogurt before they eat the savory stuff, I don't like that's yeah. their choice. And that, I guess, then comes back to um, Ellen Satter's. So you're responsible. You're not necessarily putting um, chocolate drops and chocolate sauce on there with it but sure you can as well and there's been I've seen some great experiments with um, feeding professionals putting those things on there and the children still eat their vegetables even though they might have licked chocolate sauce off a spoon beforehand it's giving and obviously choice and control with your um, children or families you see but obviously with food that's one of the biggest things that children can control and probably why there's so many different things coming out there the, the root cause of it is something else but it comes out in their food yeah so, um, yeah, so then I guess we've covered off that. <laughs> and then these are just some of how you can um, get in touch with us. Um, and also we've got um, some of the papers that we sort of referred to with the things that we've been talking about. So, And Jackie has this available for you guys afterwards if you do want any of this information. So um, that's it. That's yeah, us, and if, you've got, if you've got any questions, I think if we're up to question time, Jackie. You can type them or go, Jackie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both, Phoebe and, and Mandy. That was such a, a dynamic presentation and gave us a real sense of the flavour and the sound of what you do. So it was really great to, to hear that <laughs> presentation in its in its many, many different forms. And the sound is great now, which is good to hear as well. Oh, if good. you do have any questions of either Mandy or Phoebe and would like to ask those, um, if you want to put your hand up, if you've got your camera on, um, they'll ask you to ask the question. Or if you if you can't have your camera on, don't prob- no problem. You can use the chat box as well. It looks like Tash has got a question there. Though. Yeah. Oh, you may have said this. I hope you didn't, but because like, my computer crashed right in the middle. But I find I have a little person who has sensory processing. Um, a disorder he's been diagnosed with that but I find a worry bowl at the table has really changed our life so I was just probably I'm not sure if you said that when you were doing your um when I lost you but I found it's just been life-changing <laughs> so we have we do in one of our songs we talk about and I'm a proposer of as you have your um safe plate or your exploration plate so having that plate off the sorry I put my hand there so having so if that's your main eating area and you have a sphere there be a bowl plate that they can put something there that they're learning about, or their learning bowl, that's what I often call it. Um, but yeah, a worry bowl or something that they, they want. But 
the amazing power of it being within I their guess I'm wondering is that the wrong term for it just calling it a worry bowl <laughs> oh, okay. oh I mean like I'm not a psychologist I don't think so I don't really know but perhaps yeah using positive language yeah. with it so I do call it a learning bowl or an explore safe, pl safe, like plate. safe plate yeah it's a safe yeah. food or um yeah exploration I think definitely as a way to get it within their definite okay. within their space and again just the no pressure around yeah, it yeah, because battle, like that little broccoli you know, picture and so it's in you know they might they look at it today the next actually, week they might touch it um, then and two it might be 20 later, times really love. yeah might be or 50 more. might be six then, months like it's yeah, really a process but if it goes on that way about exploring that food play, so we always like have more and more um, often a food mm. interaction through the week the or through the month or ones, what, so then it's and coming Closer and closer to that man the meal time, yeah. whether they're going to eat and it. And P.S. Cash, you look really familiar. Yeah, you do. To be able to, um, to sniff <laughs> it, <laughs> lick it, and visit. I know, I was thinking that before too. I might have seen you at some of Jackie's things. Like, um, <laughs> food, so yeah, I'm on there. No, Thank you. So I just I found that just because um, that. sometimes when um, um, there's that anxiety that comes with trying new things, just to knowing like that you can play with it, but then get it off your like. plate and is then really, go around yeah, yeah, it's a big thing that has worked for us. And well, it's fantastic. Keep going with it. My own might change it in your hand, and then yeah, but but maybe give your child the opportunity to choose the name of the plate is, and it might be the the funky blue plate. Like it doesn't have to be the learning bowl, you know, or whatnot. Cucumber. I just think the only thing the only thing sometimes you can yeah, see um, really tricky is how to I mean I know you're not necessarily pressuring them but if you keep on offering that at the meal time you can kind of get food jags where they then drop that all together so they nearly got it and then they might push back on it so just to be um, consistent with offering it but not like today so um, yeah but that's a really great yeah song snippet. Look at but it. I think it's also great thank like, you that's great I love what you're doing <laughs> thank you no 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 I don't want it in anybody hand, else but once it's in there we will buy we'll explore it mm. and I sometimes put on there I have a actually. question for yes, you guys. Yes, um, one of your earlier slides had a picture of them. a whole lot of food but on a plate, how it used to be and how it is it. now. Could you talk what? a little bit to oh, that? Yeah, yes. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. That's I'll a great one. Um, so I guess that's really um, understanding that children eat for all different, we all eat for all different reasons. Um, and even from a um, growth perspective, you know, if you look at a growth curve of a child in that first year, they grow dramatically. And so their intake is so great. Um, and then once they hit that sort of one year mark, their energy needs for their, their size obviously drop off quite a lot but also um, around that time developmentally children um, don't want to eat because it's cold or they don't want to eat because their t-shirt's itchy yeah. um, and so I think it's really about realizing that what we get nutritionally isn't from one meal mm -hmm. it's not even from one day mm -hmm. um, if a child's unwell they might not be eating for three or four days that much and then they might eat huge amounts to compensate for the previous days so as I said when like you know you might eat pasta cheese and a carrot I mean even if you're looking at that today plate where it's a piece of toast with some butter we smidge egg. of egg and and mandarin I'd say that's pretty comprehensive. I mean, you've got um, egg protein and you've got fruits there and you've got car carbohydrate, complex carbohydrates that looks like a whole grain kind of toast, you know. That's pretty good. So I wouldn't really be worried. The thing is, is again, sort of supporting that child and having that choice and control. I mean, you would think maybe to the off of the, of the plate, you have an array of foods on offer and they've chosen that to put on their plate or through you said no I only want xyz you know a child is born with the ability to um uh, sense their when they're full and um mm. we often coach that out of them one more one more bite you know it's a very um natural thing from a parent to want to feed their child their job is done but we need to listen to them for them to be able to express that they're not full I know, I, know. They are full, yeah. so. I know in our house we definitely have eating days and <coughs> non-eating days. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and then also, I mean, if you swapped yesterday and today to breakfast and dinner, uh, each of my own children eat at different day parts. Mm. You know, they might be a breakfast Absolutely. lunch eater and not a nighttime eater. And I know coming back to division of responsibility in terms of setting meal times. Um, especially for dinner, especially when they were a little bit younger, I had to have dinner at 4.30. I was lucky that I was able to be at home and that would be my main meal. And then they would have supper 
later, which might be an apple and, you know, a piece of cheese or something like that. So um, just being mindful of what your, when your child's main eating time is, and then trying to have the range of foods on offer for that. And also thinking about, this is a little bit separate to this slide, but, you know, culturally in Australia, we tend to eat things like toast and cereal or whatnot for breakfast. I've got nothing against all of those things. Obviously there's better choices within all of those. Um, but, you know, my brother's just come back from China. He's lived there for 10 years. When I go there, we eat a savory pancake with some weird, some fried stick in it and vegetables. And I don't know what we have. It's delicious. <laughs> Um, and so thinking about perhaps the different foods that your child does like and what they can eat at that day part, um, they, they can have um, beef curry for breakfast if they want to eat it, you know, like whatever, what, whatever floats your boat Or on eggs that. for dinner. Or eggs for dinner. I, I call it Brenna. Breakfast for dinner is always a winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so just being mindful that sometimes they will eat a lot and sometimes they won't and that, that's, that's okay, okay. Being, being mindful of that. That's a good question. Thank you, Ooh. Jackie. I love that slide. That Oh, just on that, I'm pretty sure there's a lady, I've just forgotten her name. Oh, Kids Eat Colour. She's a paediatric dietitian in the States and she's on Instagram and she has brilliant uh, info, info, pho photographic yeah, uh, infographics like this. They're so good to be able to talk to a point. And it's Jason, Jason's computer. Hello. You've got to take yourself off mute. There you Sorry, go. it's the first time I've used Zoom. Oh, <laughs> oh you're doing great. Um, I'm really glad that you mentioned ki kids eat in colour. Um, she's somebody I follow. I've followed for a long time, actually, and I find her um, stories and her her posts and everything so helpful and so easy to understand. Mm. And she does question question time and whatever, and you can ask her a whole bunch of things. Mm. I think she's got a lot of followers, so um, I don't always get my my questions answered, which is one of the questions I was going to ask. Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, when you talked about um, the division of responsibility, what, when and where, I was curious about the when. Um, I've got a three-year-old who goes through sort of eating periods and not eating periods and there are times when she seems to be just always hungry and um, with the when, like, I, I'm not sure, do I just keep feeding her when she wants, when she says, oh, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. It, I, I can't, sometimes I can't decide if she's mindlessly eating mm. um, because she's bored or because, you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, How old is she? She's three. She's three. just so, turned three. Yeah, so I guess the thing is, and I know actually Kids Eat the Colour has a lovely um, picture of this um, is setting up what your meal times are and I know she's only three but having like a child of that age they actually needs, understand quite they do it. yeah and but also um, you'd say probably a child of that age needs to eat every two hours two and a half hours so if you think about it brekkie's at seven then we've got morning tea at 9 30 lunch is 11 30 you know then 2 30 or 5 30 and then and then potentially a supper as well, be it dessert or supper, depending on when they're having their sleeps or if she sleeps. Um, and I know that, um, actually I actually don't know what the kids eat colors actual, uh, Jenny, I think her name is, but no, her real name. <laughs> I think it's color. Jenny, yeah. Yeah, um, she also talks to this as well, and I 100% um, agree with it, is saying, we've just had breakfast, in two hours, we will be having morning tea. Right now it's playtime and that's what we're gonna focus on now. And I think that can be supported. I mean, that's what we do with our music, but I know as well, um, uh, colleagues of mine who are OTs and stuff, having the charts up there mm. to be able, like they do at preschools and stuff, like right now the it's playtime. Um, and this is what we're doing in this particular time. Obviously she doesn't read the time, but having those kind of time spaces and then having the food there to, and this takes time as well. Like this isn't something that she's just, once you put the pretty planner up that she'll follow, but, you know, having the, the for it to become part of your rhythm and routine, which is so important for the little ones. Because yeah. does she go to preschool or childcare? Uh, yeah, to daycare three days yeah. a week. Yeah. And they're not going to the kitchen and getting her snacks in between nice. mealtime, that's for sure. So she does understand that. And it's actually really important for children to feel hunger. 
That's a cue of our body. Um, and that doesn't mean they're dying. It means that their body, and, and, and they will still function efficiently. It's just the body, the physiological response to often the acid kind of going through the digestive system and grumbling. And they can feel that, um, or they might feel hangry. I feel that often. Um, but it's really <laughs> important putting in those that rhythm and routine so that they understand. And the more and more you use that, you, it will help you, but also help her to be able to have that. And I think the other thing is, is I find when I'm more organized for the day, um, then I have my snacks ready, like there's yeah. no meltdown. So sometimes what I did, especially during COVID, having the children all home homeschooling is I would often actually pack the lunchbox. So I would be like, all right, now it's snack time, you know, so I wasn't in the kitchen being a revolving restaurant, um, having that there for her. So you've got that packed if you're having a day at home, you know, when you go out to the zoo or something you've got all your things there but when you're at home you get a bit lazy on that so having that ready but yeah really trying to set up that those boundaries for her because she does understand that if she has them at childcare, she just doesn't want to play that game at yeah. home and yeah. maybe find out what her routine time wise is at daycare yeah. because then that means that it's consistent at home and daycare because once yeah. they're in that routine what does it take four days to create a habit Oh, I don't know, 28, <laughs> a million, but um, with repetition, mm. um, it, it's, it's formed much quicker. Um, I hope, am I okay to ask another question? Yeah, go. Okay, good. Um, one, this is an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and I'm actually myself writing a book on it um, around, um, or even like it's a body positivity book for children, um, a guide for parents, I guess. Um, and one of the things that I've sort of the research that I've done and that I've written about is, is about sort of getting children to understand those body cues and, you know, um, when they're full and when they're not and kind of like doing like a, almost like a body scan sort of thing. And, and I just, I guess I just wanted to check in with you um, when we talk um, or oh, like when we're having dinner or whatever and she says she's finished, I say, check in with your tummy. Is your tummy full? Um, you know, has, has your tummy had enough? Um, or when she's hungry, she'll say, my tummy needs food or my tummy feels empty. Like are they, are they sort of like I'm on the right track with that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's um, non-emotional language, and, you know, it's just what, what are you feeling inside? How do you feel? I think, would you agree with that? What do you use with um, patients? Uh, I wouldn't be not necessarily with client, but I know with my own kids, if they say they're full, then they're, they're done. If, if, even if their tummy doesn't feel full, full, if they're done, they're, they're done. But yeah. once they leave the table, that's, that's, they're, do, they're done. Because yeah, they're going to clean up the table. <laughs> um, because sometimes the different foods that we eat may hit, they hit our stomach in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've had... You're done a, with spice, for instance. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you've had a bowl of soup, it's going to be different to eating a steak. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah. I don't think there's anything no. wrong with asking them, how are you feeling yeah, after Yeah, I think it. it's That's good, good for that body awareness to... It's been yeah, like sort of trying to encourage it. that intuitive eating kind of... Um, philosophy I guess yeah, yeah. which the, I think for her then if she's getting the language that she knows that you'll respond to she'll be like my tummy's feeling empty I think it might be time right. yeah. yeah and then you'll <laughs> say I can see on our chart here that it's playtime and food's <laughs> gonna come in 40 minutes so let's go back into the sand pit <laughs> um great thank you I, I had one more question as yeah. well when I, like sometimes I get a little bit nervous about what they're teaching her at daycare around food and around yes. I get nervous all yeah. the time <laughs> um, you know around those words like you know she says <coughs> like she's used words like healthy mm. and um don't eat cookies because they're not healthy and yeah you know, you need to eat an apple. If you've got a sore tummy, it'll make you feel better and things like that. And I try to um, sort of say, well, what does healthy mean to you? And what do you understand? And you know, sort of encourage that it's all right to eat cookies. We have that as sometimes food and, all, you know, like I, I, I guess sometimes though, I feel a little bit stuck and a little bit unsure and I'm scared that I'm going to be saying the wrong thing. Um, and also like, I do this sort of work with my clients as well. So mm. like, what, what would you suggest when, when client or when, well, yeah, clients, kids, whatever are using words like healthy and unhealthy, good and bad in terms yes. of Look, I just, just so you know, I feel the exact same 
fear and nervousness about that professionally, but also personally. I've got and a that daughter. Was one of the reasons why yeah, we, why we we're wanted doing to this. go into daycares, particularly yeah, yeah. because there is that they are providing food for the children, they are creating the environment in which that child's eating, they are potentially projecting on their own ideals mm. as to. Yeah. what's healthy and what's not healthy mm. and sometimes the healthy stuff is actually not the healthy stuff so- I, I think the thing with that is obviously you're somebody that is incredibly aware um, both personally and professionally um, I think with food time and time again the research shows that it's the main carer that is the most um, okay. impactful on the children um, obviously more and more children are in educate like formal education settings these days mm. but still you still even if they're at school you know you say there's potential for 50 percent I know when I'm designing menus you from an RDI perspective you look at 50 percent of the nutrient intake for home but that's still 50 percent at um out of that care so I I'm coming across it more with my own daughter who's 11 so it's starting to get into the body space kind of yeah. thing as well and so I'm very much of everybody eats differently and chooses different things for different reasons at home I feel shapes. for us this is and I'm responsible back to the DOR that this is the way that we're going to eat. And I'm choosing those foods for you for a reason. Um, or, you know, I think maybe teacher Becky thinks that that might be a nice I- idea to eat apples. And that's something that, that she's come to, and there's nothing wrong that she's doing. I mean, it's not saying drink acid. No. But like it's just, you know, um, there's different ways to be able to help you do that let's figure out why your tummy's sore you know like or or whatnot Mm. so um not putting down those spaces because really those educators are truly trying to do the right thing all educators are so passionate about children and that's why they're in that space and they do they genuinely care so much so we don't want to bring them down with Mm. it that doesn't help anybody um but also i think um, I'm very fond of having chats with people about it, just saying, look, I'm just a little bit worried about that. This is maybe, you know, these are some resources that I've read and it kind of says something different, but talking, not writing emails because everything can be lost in an email or on a note um, and just saying, can we maybe learn together or, or whatnot? I know that's really hard because I really don't like confrontation either sometimes, but it is like, I've had a situation at my my children's own school and I make little bliss balls um, and uh they they have they have sprinkles on them so because my son won't eat them and we're allowed nuts at our school so I know that's a way that he can have something with protein and uh, chia seeds and all this kind of stuff which is great but then he got told he can't have that because it has sprinkles and I'm like I make the decision what's going on the lunchbox if you're not happy with that come talk to me don't tell my three-year-old because then he now then doesn't want to eat the bliss balls with his sprinkles at home and these are color free sugar free sprinkles mind you they're expensive but (laughs) so it's more like uh, I think if you talk directly with them rather than funneling in different ways to have that conversation Mm. but look we, uh, this is why we do what we do we're trying to not only give language to the child but to help the educators with some more resources as well and parents and parents too yeah, yeah. thank you so thank much you. Mandy that's thank a really great much. way of, of answering that question and thank you for the questions as well um uh, our friend who's not Jason um <laughs> thank you. great Great, uh, great questions that were posed there. What we'd like to do before we finish up in our last 10 minutes or so is to give you a chance, if you haven't had a chance to ask questions or to reflect a bit more directly on what we've heard today from Mandy and Phoebe, is we're going to put you in some breakout rooms now. So Aidan's going to send you an invitation to join a group and it'll be with two or three other people, probably three people. And what we'd like you to do for a couple of minutes is just share reflection. So how can you use what you've learned in the last hour today? So we've had a great presentation and some really on topic questions and answers about this idea of making meals marvelous for children. So how can you apply it if you've got young children at home in your own homes and how can you help parents, carers and other educators that you know work with this group to make meals more marvelous for children. So I'll put you in those groups now and you don't have to do anything to come out. In about five minutes, you'll get a countdown from 60 to one and you'll automatically come out and we'll see you shortly. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, I think we're almost all back now. Thank you for that opportunity to have a chat. Can I get, um, I'll get everyone to put their microphones on mute again, if you wouldn't mind, just so we've got good sound quality for this last piece. 
And could I get you to type into the chat box one thing that you reflected on as helpful in your chat, in your chat, in your conversation that you just had there? So just in the chat box there, what is it that you learned or what is it that you reflected on? What is it that you've got to consider in this presentation so far? So we've got some great comments coming through. So the language that we might use in the home about food and the idea about choice and control, who has what and in what areas. I think there's some great things. So anything else that you've learned today or got to reflect on in your group? Eating the rainbow was a lovely idea. The idea about the worry or exploration bowl or plate. It's great for others. Good. So some really valuable things coming through there. Thank you for those reflections. We've just got a few minutes to finish up. And I would like to, I'm um, just going to share my screen briefly with you and show you what we're going to be doing. I've had an opportunity to connect in, which is lovely with others. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to tell you about some of the other things we've got coming up. So our holding space free webinar next month on the 10th of February is on laughter yoga, more than a little fun. So it's someone who's very um, experienced in running yoga, uh, laughter yoga workshops. There's no downward dogs involved. It's all just kind of interactive. So she's going to be presenting on that. So feel free to register for that if you'd like to join us for that one. We have a range of other events coming up online over the next six months, and you can access those on the website. If you registered for today, which you clearly did, you can see those coming up. We have two groups starting in March. We have a supervision group online and an art therapy group online. So if you're interested in either of those, you can check those out too. And I think as a farewell, it might be nice to um, have Mandy and Phoebe sing us out. Do you guys, you guys are right? Goodbye, goodbye. Which one should we do? I'm oh. going to do Peter Patter. All right. Can we do so, our rain song? Because that's our favourite. Do you know what? New one. We actually wrote this. Um, oh, yeah, we're in Port Macquarie. Oh, yes. Um, and it started pouring with rain when we'd finished writing it. Yeah, it was the beginning of the break of the drought. Ah, oh, what are the chords? Phoebe and Mandy for a wonderful presentation and thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.